Good evening, ladies and children and boys and girls and gentlemen and space aliens and whatever. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Michael C. Hardy. Welcome to Sunday Night History Chat. Welcome to my library. I hope everybody is doing really, really well out there this evening. Uh, it's been a beautiful day here in the mountains of Western North Carolina, uh, February 25th, 37 degrees right now, just a gorgeous, beautiful day. Had a wonderful walk out and about. Hope everybody is doing really well. Our normal folks out there, Ryan and Adam and, and Bobby and Jason and Robert, all the way from Arizona and our friend down in Australia. I uh, hope everything is well down in Australia, in the land of down under. Is it like tomorrow down there? Yes, it's tomorrow down there. So you can be in the future. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining me this evening. I hope everybody is doing really well. Uh, it's been, I've been, it was an extremely busy week uh, this past week, uh, traveling, doing different things, getting recovered from going to Charlotte, working at the little park that I work at. Uh, and doing a little writing and research, and we're going to really tackle that this week because I really don't have any place to go, but I may sneak in a research trip or two uh, down the mountain. Uh, Gary says, Jerry says that it's 12.30 on p.m. on Monday, so that's awesome. Um, took me a minute to wrap my head around that, but that's okay. Uh, we're going to dive in here in just a minute. I do not have any speaking engagements this upcoming week. <clears throat> we'll have a new uh, blog post dropping tomorrow. Um, after that, there was only, this one is about uh, burying Confederates in Memphis. Uh, and then after that, I think there was one more Memphis post over on looking at the, con looking for the Confederate war. Um, and I encourage you to check those out. And then we'll be wrapping that up. Uh, strangely enough, I think I've written more about Memphis and the war than anybody else. Like ever. Didn't set out to do that. But that's the way that it has worked out. Uh, there's Wes in Bristol and Harney Flanagan down in eastern North Carolina. And David Pope over in East Tennessee. And um, Gavin down in Morganton. Um Hope everybody is um, doing really, really well out there. So many of you got the news um, about the demise, I guess, of um, Civil War times in America's Civil War. Uh, some folks are saying that it's going to continue on in a digital format. The Facebook page is still being updated. Uh, I'm not really sure what's going on with that, but the word on the street uh, from uh, Gary Alderman and from the folks at um, Emerging Civil War and all of those places say that it's a done deal. Uh, that um, I, I even saw someone post a few days ago. Uh, that uh, they had sent in their renewal or something and it had been returned to them. Uh, and so I thought we would take a few minutes this evening uh, and talk a little bit about magazines uh, dealing with that time period uh, over the past 160 years. Um, and I think... In many cases, we kind of blow off uh, magazine articles um, these days uh, as, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll be really honest, even though I subscribe to Civil War Times and America's Civil War, and I have for a long time, I've written for both of them. We'll talk more about them in a minute. But a lot of times the articles are not real deep, at least lately they've not been deep. But that's that's me. Um, growing um, as a as a reader, as a researcher, as a writer. Um, when I was a kid back in the 80s, uh, boy, I couldn't get enough of, of Civil War Times, Civil War Times Illustrated. Um, you know, I, I went out and I saw old issues uh, and I subscribed uh, and I just, it was just um, good stuff and I soaked in every word. Um, but Let's let's take a look at some of these. And I actually spent some time this afternoon um, and 
tried to create a list and I actually talked to a couple of other folks and sent them my list and said, Hey, what am I missing uh, off of this list? And I had some good um, banter and discussion this afternoon, um, trying to um, create this list of everything I could think of. And then there are a couple of things. There's one or two things that are not on this list. Newsletters I didn't really put on this list. And um, I have stuff like the Antietam Journal, which is published twice a year, um, that um, I really uh, don't know what to do with. Um, is it, is it a magazine? Is it a journal? But I've actually got two other journals on this list. So maybe I should have put them on there. It is interesting how a well-written magazine story has the power to change the course of history, even decades into the future. Veterans were interested early on in getting their story into print of getting, quote, the record straight or the record correct. And of course, they're getting the story right or correct was really just telling their point of view. Uh, at times, boy, they argued about what history was correct and uh, what history, you know, who who got it wrong. Um, you know, there's the debates with uh, Longstreet and, and Taylor and, um, and Lane and Wilcox versus Mahone. Uh, and um, just just some really good things. And I think sometimes it is good to remember that that these letters uh, in these early journals and magazines were were their opinion uh, about what was going on. But we as historians dive into these resources often first, or at least that we should dive into them first. You know, if we're a broad example, if we're going to write about um, Longstreet at Gettysburg, uh, then we need to dive back into um, what Longstreet wrote about Gettysburg first. Instead of looking at the historiography, see what Longstreet wrote first. That's the important part Um of the equation of, of the things that we need to look at. So let's run through this list. Uh, I might should have put it in chronological order, but a lot of these overlap. So it's in an alphabetical order of this evening. Uh, so um, let's just go through that list and see what we can find first on my list. And there may be some that I don't have on this list that you will drop me a note about. Uh, first on the list is America's Civil War. Uh, it was uh, established by Rory Morris Jr. in 1987. And from all the news that we can get, um, it met its demise here in 2024. I probably wrote more for that magazine, Glossy Magazine, uh, than any other magazine out there. Uh, I, I wrote four or five articles for them, maybe more, um, in the past. And our friend... Um, that um, Bobby Joe Goodson said, yes, I did have an article. Um, I had many articles, but um, about killing Jackson. Um, but anyway, uh, Blue and Gray Magazine. So that was America's Civil War. Blue and Gray Magazine was established in 1982 and ran through uh, uh, 2017. Uh, its editor was David Roth. And a lot of people really like this magazine. Uh, it was devoted, each issue was devoted to a certain battle or a portion of a battle. And they were written by leading historians and they had great maps, uh, not only maps showing, you know, troop movements, but they had modern maps. So we could grab a copy of the blue and gray and go to Chancellorsville or Chickamauga uh, and explore the battlefield with that map. Uh, that was always fabulous. I never wrote an article for Blue and Gray, but I reviewed a lot of books for them uh, there um, the last four or five years uh, that they were on a print run. Uh, so interesting publication. Regret that's gone. Camp Chase Gazette uh, was created in 1973, and it is still being published today. Uh, they actually published my very first article 
um, you know, I should have looked that up back um, in the late 1990s, I think it was. Uh, it was on the use of um, knapsacks of, of, of soldiers wearing knapsacks during battle. Uh, and so, um, but they're still around uh, to this day. Um, Civil War Courier is still around. It's a newspaper format. Uh, they also, that same company, uh, owns Camp Chase Gazette. They publish, um, they had a civilian magazine at one time, uh, and they publish artillerymen. Uh, so um, they're still around. Uh, and then we move into our first journal. Uh, that first journal um, that I have on my list is called Civil War History, a Journal of the M Middle Period, uh, published by Kent State Press. Uh, it started in 1954 and is still published today. And uh, it's quarterly. It's scholarly. You're probably not going to recognize anybody uh, who writes for them. Uh, and a lot of their articles are not going to deal with aspects of uh, the, the mid 19th century time period that you're going to be want that you want to read. Uh, I hate to say that. I have never subscribed to some war history. I have subscribed to another journal we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, but um it's hit or miss, you know, so much of the academic side of publishing uh, does not focus on troops or battles or um, leaders. Uh, it's much more of the socioeconomic uh, cultural study. And, it, and it's Civil War history did not start out that way. I've got several old issues from like the, the 60s or the 70s over there. One that deals with prisons and, and, and the whole issue that deals with prisons and things. Um, but you're usually not going to get that today. But it's still around. Civil War Monitor is next. Uh, it is edited by Terry A. Johnson Jr., who started out working at North and South. Um, Civil War Monitor tends to skew a little toward the North. Uh, that's just the culture that we live in. But at the same time, Gary W. Gallagher was doing a really good series on voices from the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, the last issue I think I actually looked at, uh, he was up, that was up to a part six uh, in that series. I actually subscribed to this magazine. Uh, so um, it will become the mainstay. And uh, their articles are... Um, pretty in-depth pieces. Um, so maybe, but I think it only comes out quarterly. I, I should have looked that up, but I don't know. Uh, no, uh, that's fine. Um, but I guess Civil War Monitor will take over and, and that readership will probably grow. Uh, Civil War Navy uh, was uh, Civil War Navy, the magazine I don't subscribe to probably should. Uh, it started in 2012. Uh, it publishes four times a year. Uh, so um, if you're really into the naval aspects, I probably might should subscribe um, to that way. Um, Civil War News has a ton of reenacting news in it. Uh, it's been published for more than 50 years. Uh, it is released every month. It's like a newspaper, but they do have some really good articles uh, in there. Uh, and um, really good articles um, from time to time. Just just good stuff. From 1990 to 2000, uh, we had Civil War Regiments, a journal that was published by uh, Ted Savas and David A. Woodbury. Um, I have several issues of that as well, but uh, it's not been published since 2000. Uh, occasionally, Savas Beatty will have copies um, for sale on their website. Um, be great to have something like that uh, once again and to see where it goes. Uh, Civil War Times Illustrated, the magazine that uh, started this um, conversation, um, was founded in 1962 and ended in 2024. It was originally uh, published by Robert Fowler. It was based out of Gettysburg. I actually read someplace that um, the uh, 100th anniversary of the reenactment in Gettysburg uh, was where the first issue um, was sold. Uh, so uh, that's a, that's an interesting, um, interesting little piece of history there. Columbia was a quarterly uh, that was very short lived, and I only have one copy of it here. It's got something good in it about McClellan in 1862 and the Seven Days. Uh, pretty decent article, but it was extremely short lived. I think maybe just two years or something like that. 
Confederate veteran was originally founded in 1893 and it ran to 1932. Uh, it was established by S. A. Cunningham of Nashville. It began as a newsletter to help raise funds for a monument to Jefferson Davis in Richmond and then became the official organ for the United Confederate Veterans. Um, second editor was Edith D. Pope. Uh, and then that goes away. Confederate veteran goes away in 1932 and then is rebirthed uh, in 1984 as the official organ for the sons of the Confederate veterans. Uh, as we talk here a little bit later about the Century Magazine series uh, and um, uh, Southern Historical Society papers, a lot of times the Confederate veteran was for the rank and file. Uh, in the um, Confederate Army. Uh, so um, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, later on, as the, the UDC kind of takes it over, United Daughters of Confederacy try and kind of take it over, um, there's not as much quality. But at the, at the same time, you know, the veterans themselves that are writing these pieces have died uh, or they're no longer able to write. Uh, so, um, Interesting publication. Gettysburg Magazine. Uh, Bob Younger originally started that magazine. Has always, to my knowledge, come out twice a year. It was founded in 1989. It is now being published by the University of Nebraska Press. I've probably written six or seven articles in that magazine about various Confederate uh, men uh, who fought in the battle uh, or regiments that fought. Um, my last piece in there was on uh, foodstuffs and the campaign, uh, Confederate campaign into Pennsylvania. Uh, another magazine that I do subscribe to. Hallowed Ground is published quarterly by the American Battlefield Trust. Um, American Battlefield Trust started out as the um, Association for the Preservation of Civil War Sites. Uh, and then they became the merged with another group and called the Civil War Battlefield Trust or the Civil War Preservation Trust. Uh, and then they were um, the Civil War Battlefield Trust, I think it was. Um, their articles are tailored to certain battles, um, some really good maps, some really good photography. It is for people who have joined the American Battlefield Trust. I am a member, have been a member since it was the Association for the Preservation of Civil War Sites. Um, it is the most distributed, glossy Civil War magazine on the market. Uh, they have a membership of 45,000. Uh, and so that is by far the most um, distributed one. Uh, do I always agree with everything the Battlefield Trust does? No, but they have saved over 50,000 acres from development. So. I think that's important. And then I mentioned the other journal on this list a few minutes ago. It's called Journal of the Civil War Era, published by UNC Press. Um, started in 2010. Uh, most of the articles in there, I don't really care for, but occasionally they will have something uh, outstanding. And um, I guess that's why I continue to subscribe to it. Um, at least I think it's still in print. I don't remember getting an issue in the recent past, but maybe I just need to renew or something. Uh, as I said, 2010 published by UNC Press, uh, academic in nature. Um, another magazine, Glossy, that is still in print uh, is Military Images. Uh, that was published uh, beginning in 1979. Uh, their masthead says, quote, Military Images is America's only magazine dedicated solely to the study of Civil War photography, and our ongoing mission is to showcase, interpret, and preserve these rare images. Uh, if, if it's, it's really great stuff. It really is. Uh, and I had a chance to um, speak at a conference last year with one of their editors, and so it's, it's really good stuff. And then one thing, my friend... Um, Randy reminded me about uh, a little a little while ago as we were talking, North South Trader. Uh, it uh, originally came out in 1973, and it's still in publication now. It's not just Doug relics, uh, but it's um, uniforms, musical instruments, clothing. I already said uniforms. Uh, just a lot of Doug stuff, but a lot of stuff that's not Doug. Uh, so um, it's that's um, really really good stuff. 
1882, uh, we get um, a Southern Bivouac. Uh, it was published by the Southern Historical Association of Louisville. Uh, Basil Duke, uh, who rode with um, John Hunt Morgan, played a major role in its publication. And remember, I'm just giving you the short version uh, of each of these because it's 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 a long list. Uh, but uh, started in 1882 and then kind of ceased publication in 1887. Um, not one that I've dug through a bunch, but I mean, it's it's out there and it's available. Uh, probably the most important on the list uh, is the Southern Historical Society papers. Um, the Southern Historical Society was organized in New Orleans, had a bunch of big names. It's 1869, a bunch of big names connected with it, like Braxton Bragg and Dabney Maury and Simon Buckner and a whole bunch of other folks. Um, there's eventually 52 volumes. I think originally it came out like once a month. But in those last few volumes, you'll have one big, thick volume uh, that covers the entire year. And that's the only only publication that you got. Um, I have this set like I have Confederate Veteran, the original here in the Michael C. Hardy Library. Uh, but I have the Southern Historical Society papers up there as well. Um, it's it's like. When you dig deep, um, it's one of the primary things that you go to. Uh, so, um, that's, that's just one of them. The Century Magazine, um, started publishing in 1881 and they published a series, a bunch of articles in the 1880s that becomes what we call battles and leaders. Um, and there are, um, about 230 ish. There's a couple of later volumes, um, but, but the primary set comes out in four volumes, eventually comes out in four volumes and there are 230 letters and diaries or not diaries or letters, um, battlefield reports. Uh, and this has got all of the major players in it from both sides. And I browsed through today and, and just jotted a few names down of the people, uh, the men who wrote articles in battles and leaders like, Abner Doubleday and Stephen D. Lee and John D. M. Bowden, Beauregard, Joseph E. Johnston, John C. Friedmont, uh, Lou Wallace, U.S. Grant, Don Carlos Buell, Ambrose Burnside, uh, William T. Sherman, O. O. Howard, E. Kirby Smith, Basil Duke, John B. Hood, Benjamin F. Cheatham, Jubal Early, uh, Orlando B. Wilcox, Wade Hampton, Horace Porter. I mean, they are the folks that are writing these articles. Uh, that that become what we call um, battles and leaders. Um, but at the time, they were published in Century Magazine. And they've got really good artwork in there as well. Uh, so um, once again, if, if you're doing research uh, on a certain battle or person, um, that's one of those things to look at uh, very early on in the research. Um because just about every battle, they, there's something in there about them. Probably the first uh, Southern magazine after the war uh, is The Land We Love um, that was founded in 1886 by um, Daniel Harvey Hill. Um, this is not specifically a, a magazine or journal about the war, but, you know, he had poems and other literary works. He had a scientist write stuff. Um, about agriculture uh, in there as well. It only exists till 1869 as the land we love. Uh, but there are stories that deal with uh, the history of the war in there. Uh, there's a letter from um, John B. Palmer talking about um, Chickamauga uh, that wasn't published any other place that I've ever found, but it's in the land that we love. That goes from 1866 to 1869. Uh, and then it merges with um, this other journal that's called the Richmond Eclectic or the New Eclectic uh, in April of 1869. And then it's renamed in 1871 to the Southern Magazine. And it eventually folds in 1875. You can find that. I believe all the issues are on archive.org, uh, just like Battles and Leaders and Southern Historical Society papers are all on um, archive.org. Uh, 
United Condotters of the Confederacy had their own magazine from 1837 to present. Uh, that is the official organ of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, yes, I have a few copies of that in here as well. And then there are a couple of others that I think I would be remiss that, I've, that I didn't, if I didn't mention. Um, actually, there's one other regular magazine that was published four times a year. Uh, that I didn't even remember that I had two copies of, but it was called Civil War Book Review. Uh, and it came out quarterly. This is fall 2001. Uh, and it just basically reviewed the plethora of, of um, books about the time period and about the war um, in here. Um, but I only have two copies. I'm not sure when it started, and I'm not so sure when it went away. Um, LSU did a book review thing too, which I actually wrote a review for uh, a while back. Um, but I don't know about how long this publication was around. This says that this is volume three in fall of 2001. So that gives you an idea. Um, but two others I will talk about, and then we'll look at your comments and questions. Um, I think I would be remiss not to mention the National Tribune. Uh, that started out as a weekly newspaper uh, that was considered the, quote, premier union veterans newspaper, kind of like the um, Southern Historical Society papers or Confederate veteran. Uh, it started as a monthly and then it went to weekly. It existed from 1877 to 1917. It is mostly federal, but there are some Confederate contributions from time to time. Um Savas Beatty actually has a three volume uh, index for uh, the National Tribune. I mean, there are Confederate stuff in there. Um, if I'm working on something, I'm, I'm going to flip through um, that index just to make sure I've not missed something. And then the other um, that I don't have um, and occasionally will use, but I can find most of it online, uh, the military. Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States um, is still exists, as far as I know. Um, organization for Union Veterans and then later their descendants. Um, they would write papers and present them at like a conference. Uh, and then um, those papers would be published. And there are 70 volumes total. Uh, and once again, if I'm working on something, you know, like my book on the Battle of Hanover Courthouse or on Plymouth, uh, the future book on Plymouth, uh, I will actually um, go through those and, and you know, look for, for federal accounts uh, and things. Uh, so really good stuff. Uh, so that's my list. What have I missed? Let's go up here. Um So Corey wants to know if I have all Civil War magazines. I do not. Um, there are um, obvious gaps in my collection, uh, but um, I read uh, was when I was researching, I um, found this article that was in Smithsonian Magazine, I think back in 2020, and uh, they were getting ready to display um, the... Um, they were creating a display based upon this guy's magazine collection. And he had in his collection over 7,000 titles of all genres and 83,000 individual issues. Um, I have probably, I don't know, three or 400 magazines around here. Um, Gettysburg magazine, Confederate veteran, uh, blue and gray, of course, civil war times, America civil war. Um, some of these other ones, uh, but, um, no, I don't even have close to having them all. What would be cool, but I don't, um, I'm just reading your comments right now. Um, so, uh, Billy Bubba Williams, I hope things are well down uh, in the greater Charlotte area. 
Um, I actually have the Confederate veteran. I don't have the originals. There may be one or two originals here in the house someplace. Um, but there are 30, I don't remember how many volumes are there. Um, I don't remember how many volumes, but they're bound. Uh, and they're, they're the Broadfoot reprint is the one that I have. Uh, so, um, Ah, so uh, there are actually some high quality uh, magazines published here in Australia, the Bugle and Mini News. And, you know, there are a lot of groups um, that have um, newsletter style things. Um, there was the Watchdog for a while uh, that tended to cater toward the authentic side of, of um, reenacting, the campaigner side of reenacting. Um, Brandy told me about another one. Uh, that was called the uh, firing line that I almost want to say I remember, um, but I don't think I have any issues of it uh, around here. Uh, so, and there may be other things not on my list. This is just what I worked on this afternoon. Um, So, Jason Boshures, that's an awesome question. Who knew documenting our history has its own history? Um, in the academic world, that's kind of what we call historiography, um, which is a fascinating study. Unfortunately, if you go to grad school, uh, the, the first class you're required to take is a class on historiography, at least these days in most schools. Uh, and instead of looking at a lot of primary source material, and this varies professor by professor, um, you don't look at primary source material. You look at the way that people have written about history. Uh, so instead of looking at Longstreet's writings in the Southern Historical Society papers or Longstreet's book uh, from, is it called from Manassas to Appomattox? Does that sound right? Um, it's over there on the shelf. Um, you look at, you know, the way that people have written about what Longstreet wrote. Uh, and that's really unfortunate. Now, not every writer, not every professor moves in that direction, but a lot of them do these days. Um, Bobby Joe Goodson, yes, a lot of magazines and newspapers are going um, by way of the Internet. And um, that's, you know, um, podcasts and vlogs are where it's at these days. Um, not even regular blogs. I mean, you know, people want to watch it or listen to it. They don't want to read it, which is unfortunate, but. Get what? Say again? No. I'm just reading your comments. Sorry for the quiet silence. Um, you know, there was another magazine um, as we were talking. Somebody mentioned it here. Uh, mentioned company. Yep. Brian Duckworth. Hope things are well. Uh, the company front uh, by the 26th North Carolina. I actually got their new issue like a month ago. Uh, it may still be upstairs. Uh, and um, they, they do articles. Uh, they transcribe letters and things. I've got several of their issues. Uh, and occasionally I will have something in one of those. Uh, but it actually is a well done publication. Um TJ wants to know, was Wade Hampton the son or the father? Uh, they're like a bunch of Wade Hamptons. I think ours during the war, somebody look this up real quick, is Wade Hampton the uh, third. I think that's who that was. Um, I think that's the general during the war was Wade Hampton the third. Um So there was, Scott, you were right. There was a um, 
a magazine out there uh, that was reenactor focused uh, that only lasted a, a year or two, um, had good quality graphics in it. Um, I remember the magazine. I don't know if I have any around here or not. I don't know. Uh, don't quite even remember the name of it. Corey wants to know, do I have any Civil War letters, like original letters or um, reproduction letters? Um, I do have a few original letters in there, uh, but uh, I've actually done two books. Uh, North Carolina Remembers Gettysburg and North Carolina Remembers Chancellorsville. That's nothing but letters uh, by the soldiers from North Carolina who fought in those battles. Uh, so... Um, and as far as other letter collections, uh, I've got a couple of hundred of them, probably more than that, um, from major figures and minor figures. Um, tons of stuff. Good stuff. So um, that's that's kind of a rundown on um, the journals. And like I said, um, Civil War Book Review was not in there. The Antietam Journal was not in that list because uh, these were actually upstairs um, had got had went. OK, I'm going to be honest. Uh, they had went with me to um, in October of last year to Gettysburg. I actually had a couple and then I bought a couple more at the visitor center. Uh, at the battlefield park. Uh, and they have been upstairs since I got home and pulled them out of my suitcase. And I just brought them downstairs right now. Um, so Corey wants to know if I have a copy of the two books at your house. Yes, they are upstairs and you can visit michaelchardy.com and order one tonight and I can ship them out to you tomorrow. Um, So Jason wants to know, um, are there any publications still being produced that produce the best maps? Um, Hollowed Ground has excellent maps in there. Um, they, they probably have the best maps. Gettysburg Magazine has good maps. Uh, the Antietam Journal has okay maps. Um but to be honest, uh, for a lot of these battles, uh, Savas Beatty has been producing a um, map series that covers various battles and campaigns. Uh, and so if you, I mean, they're whole books, um, you know, a couple hundred page books of nothing but maps and explanations. Um, and they are probably one of the best things to get to. Uh, will Savas Beatty eventually get to all of the battles? I don't know. Uh, but there are quite a few of those map books out there um, right now. Uh, and yes, the um, American Battlefield Trust uh, has a lot of their maps online that uh, are digitized. Uh, they have some excellent map makers. Uh, and uh, if you are a member of the American Battlefield Trust, hey, Elizabeth, come over here. Grab me that pink notebook, I think, is the right one. Let's see if Elizabeth's going to jump on camera here. No, no. no, she's not. She's hiding. Is that maps? Yes. So the American Battlefield Trust uh, has maps. Like, these are all American Battlefield Trust maps. And they will mail to you on a regular, almost like every month, uh, trying to get you to donate money to help preserve portions of battlefields. Uh, so here, um, let's find a good one. Um, right here, here is a map of um, well, that's two of Cedar Creek. Not a very good picture uh, that shows uh, troop movements uh, there at the battle in October of 1864, uh, and um, has it got modern roads? I think it does. I think some of them do. Um, but it shows you not only troop movements down to the brigade level, 
uh, but it will also show you which land is preserved and which land that they are trying to raise money to fund preservation. And then some of these maps, like this one of Ware Bottom Church, fought uh, May 20th, 1864, has actually got some modern roads on it as well. Uh, so a lot of times if I'm out battlefield tramping or working on a project, I will go through and look at these maps um, as well. Uh, so, And as you can see, there are a lot of them. So pretty good stuff, but their website's got a lot of good stuff on it as well. And um, I would I would encourage you to check those out. Um, good maps. But Savas Beatty is publishing some really good map series right now. Uh, you know, Bull Run and Gettysburg and the Wilderness. And I don't remember what else, but I got a bunch of them over there on my shelf. I think I've got one on the Bristow campaign over there. I don't remember what all. Um, so, yes. All right. So, um, gosh, if you got any more questions uh, about Mac, do you think, let me ask this question for the folks still up there with us this evening. Do you think this would make a good blog post or a podcast? Um, maybe brush this up, refine this a little bit more and put this information out there, not just on Sunday night history chat, but in a format uh, that other people could have access to. Of course, this is also live on YouTube. Uh, you can go check out my page, Hardy on history, not very much up there right now, except our live chats. Uh, but, um, you can go check that out. Maybe one day I'll get around to doing some other stuff right now. I'm just busy reading books and writing books. Uh, so, um, yeah, TJ, um, talks about the battle of red banks, which was a, a small affair over in what's now Unicoi County, Tennessee, uh, Irwin, Tennessee, um, it's it's pretty much gone. They lost that field. And that's while there are, I don't know how many acres, tens of thousands of acres that have been preserved from battlefields fought uh, in that time period. There's a lot of these fields that are gone. Uh, and we've talked about Ox Hill or Chantilly. I think we talked about that last week. You know, there's a five acre park and that's all of that battlefield that's left. Every bit of it has been developed. Um, we could probably... Um, Part of the battlefield there in Franklin, Tennessee, uh, is mostly gone. Um, some of it is still there, but some of it is gone as well. But where, you know, other of these battlefields like Olusty or, or Hanover Courthouse are almost um, pristine. Um, and then some of the national parks like Shiloh is pristine. Uh, Perryville is great. Uh, you can really, really follow the course of the battle. Uh, at those fields. Uh, so um, letters from Fort Fisher. I'm not real sure. That's that's an interesting idea. Well, I have to think about that a little bit. I don't think there is a book just on. There are a couple books on Fort Fisher, but I don't think there is a book just on the letters from Fort Fisher. Um, So Brian says, do regular shows and bring on guests. Speaking of guests, next week uh, we will be having uh, Wade Soskolowski on our program. Uh, he will be talking about Confederate Hospitals, his book, uh, Confederate Hospital uh, in North Carolina. We will be discussing that. I have that book on the shelf. I think that's it right there. Uh, and he will be joining us and we'll see where that discussion goes next Sunday night, May, March. It's not May yet. Let's not rush. <laughs> March 2nd at 8.30 p.m. Um, Adam says Bentonville is well preserved at 2,000 plus acres. Still be adding added to still being added to you are right, Adam. And the battlefield trust has done a lot of that. Uh, they have, have purchased, uh, using, um, tax funds and things, uh, March 3rd. Somebody said it's March 3rd. Who said that? You, Corey said March 3rd, whatever next Sunday night is 
March 3rd, um, two days before my birthday. Um, but yes, the Battlefield um, Trust um, has purchased a lot of those acres there at Bentonville. Uh, Scott Young says new mini golf course in the works on the southern end of Steinware Avenue in Gettysburg. I have, yes, one reason why all the ghosts have moved down the road to Sharpsburg. Uh, you know, if you know about um Gettysburg, then you know that up toward Little Round Top, there used to be a carousel, and uh, we had those big towers there for a long time. And there was a trolley. And sometimes I think the trolley might be a good idea uh, if you get tired of walking. Uh, but um, then, of course, you know that if you know about Gettysburg, you know there was World War One training camp out there in the middle of that field. And that really altered what we see at Gettysburg. And I'm sure there are other things that I just don't remember. Uh, but, um, yep, Oxford at North Anna is very well. Um, Good night, Andrea. I hope you are well. Um, yep, Wade will be with us next Sunday night, March 3rd. Um, hope everybody can join us. Um, all right, folks, if you got any other questions, drop them in the comments. Otherwise, we're going to sign off and put this big folder back on the shelf and put some other stuff away and maybe chase a few airplanes. Did you know that when the um, United Confederate Veterans Reunion was in Houston, Texas, uh, they had several airplanes on display. They were giving rides, paid rides, but they offered to give a free ride to the oldest and the youngest Confederate veterans present at the um United Confederate Veterans National Reunion in Houston. It's amazing the things that you can learn uh, as we um, dig and do research and find anything. I think that reunion was in 1919. Don't quote me on that. I don't have that in front of me. Uh, but um, Any other questions this evening? I've put Brian Duckworth's little feller to sleep. <laughs> Actually, my um, YouTube thing is called Hardy on History. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yep, yeah, but I haven't done outside of these going live there as well. I haven't done anything with it. Um, so you have to search it in quotation marks. You have to search it in quotation marks. Uh, you'll get or you, Elizabeth says you'll get wrestlers. <laughs> um, you know, if I was younger, <laughs> but I'm not, so I should probably not do that. Um, yep, Jason Baker says he saw a photo recently of a Confederate veteran posing in front of a fighter jet. Um, it's amazing. Um, here in North Carolina, a lot of times they would take some of the Confederate veterans up in airplane rides, like at the state fair or when they dig those big marches in 1919, um, celebrating the end of world war one. Um, just fascinating stuff. All right, folks, that's going to do it for me this evening. Thank you so much for joining me here in my library, hanging out for a few minutes, um, giving me, uh, one of your Sunday nights, um, 45 minutes, 50 minutes here on a Sunday night. Uh, I hope everybody has a fantastic week. Uh, and once again, just keep digging into history, uh, researching, writing, sharing. That's the thing that we have to do uh, is um, just keep digging and, and sharing. Uh, that's the best thing that we can do. Remember to check out uh, looking, for the, for the, looking for the Confederate War tomorrow. We'll have new information up. It's already written. We'll probably go up about nine o'clock in the morning. Um, thank y'all so much. And y'all have a great evening and God bless. <laughs>